So this new recording that you have is called kinetic, like yes. moving. Yeah. I mean, kinetic energy is the moment that potential energy turns into real energy. Not many people know this about me, but I actually started off studying at NYU pre-med. I wound up getting a minor in economics alongside my jazz studies degree, go figure. I love science. I've always kind of loved, and I've especially always loved physics. I don't think that the world is meant to be understood in any like real, like whatever spiritual sort of way. But I do think that it's interesting that there are certain laws that nature does abide to. And kinetic energy is something that's always kind of fascinated me. And one thing that I always loved about my residency at the Django is that you have a group of 18 musicians of, of young adults, men and women. Uh, when I call the band, I, my instructions for dress code is never suit and tie. It's always hip, but formal. So like you have a group of people who could be just like hanging out or they could be like, you know, the band and you don't know. And all of a sudden, like these people just amalgamate onto the stage, just wind up holding their instruments. I count off the first two and the first song that I always open at the Django or any set really is is actually with that title track with Kinetic. And it okay. just like starts off with like such a, with an interval of a minor ninth. It's a little bit of some intro. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It was just very <laughs> tense, right? Right. that I had in my mind is that like there's this energy this ball that's like waiting to just be like pushed ever so slightly to just start rolling that's kind of like where the idea of kinetic comes from just the fact that I've had the band for so long and haven't ever actually made a physical album of my own original material that also kind of felt like I've been waiting I've been waiting like this energy's been building this energy's been building and then like finally it's time to kind of just release it you know let the ball start rolling that's a great setup you know for us to listen to that first tune this is kinetic and this is the title track from steven feifke's new album kinetic brand new release who is also my guest today and you can hear him on the piano anybody else that we're gonna hear on that track that we should listen for yeah definitely ulysses owens jr is featured on the drums and gabriel king med is featured on the trumpet and the whole band is featured in, in certain shout chorus soli style sections. And then there is a piano solo. So you can listen for me as well. Kinetic <laughs> from the new release, Kinetic by Stephen Feifke's Big Bang.
composition and arrangement by my guest today, Stephen Feisky, who you also heard on piano. This big band, it's a brand new release. We were just talking about to lead a big band. So having that residency at Django, that's just really, I mean, having that opportunity to develop, you know, Maria Schneider with her. You, usually most bands, you see this, that they have this space where they can develop their music, play together on a regular basis. You talked about your love for arranging and posing. And the way I actually met you is by a transaction of one of my my friends who, who was buying one of your arrangements <laughs> in Germany and didn't know how to pay you for it. But you by now uh, made a pretty strong name about for arranging and composing and selling. So as far as like what the business is like, I mean, that's a common question from like many younger arrangers who are really interested in entering the business side of things is like, okay, I have this ability, I have this love, I have this want to write music for a large ensemble, for a small ensemble. Like how do I work with X vocalist? How do I work with X saxophonist. Best advice that I could offer would be basically just to start writing your own music and start developing your own voice and let things unfold naturally or, and organically from there. But when someone calls me to write for them for a fact that they want my voice, there's a, a certain level of empathy and understanding that goes into that kind of a process where, you know, especially if I'm called to be an arranger on someone else's project with a lot of respect and honor, put a bit of myself into that that like a bit of my artistic identity into that but ultimately someone who is going to purchase that record or listen to that music is not listening to it for my arrangements they're listening to it for someone else's artistic voice and their visions so there's a bit of a balancing act that goes on and the only way that you can really find out like how much of yourself the more empathetic you can be in an arranging project and process with another artist with the composing process we often perceive this as the crazy unique composer that's <laughs> only out there to express their own thoughts and things but realizing that you know you're expressing more than that and when you work with other ensembles then you're also expressing their voice that's a really important point and I hope you know some of the young composers <laughs> and arrangers take that to heart for the next one we're going to try from the record or get to hear is called unveiling of a mirror and this is also one of your compositions and arrangements this one is a bit of a funny story. I lived in an apartment where the mirror was very foggy. I could barely see the image of myself. Like I could barely see like, does this color match? Like, I don't know, but I also loved the mirror. And I started thinking about, okay, what is a mirror? A mirror is a sheet of glass with a sheet of metal behind it. When you look into the mirror, you see a reflection. There's some sort of like mirror land, let's call it, where you're looking into the mirror, like you're not actually seeing the reflection. The only difference between a mirror and a window is that a window is just a sheet of glass without metal behind it. And you can actually see through the window onto the other side. And so I started to think to myself, okay, like maybe I should just look in this mirror one day, the strange foggy mirror in my, in my bedroom and say like, okay, what am I actually seeing? And I started to notice all of these complexities about the mirror. And I actually started to look at like the glass and look at the metal behind it without focusing on my reflection. And then by doing that, I was able to actually see myself. And yeah. so I kind of took that a step further and I used that as a metaphor to say like, okay, in interactions with someone, I, you know, like, okay, you can talk to someone, you can listen to someone, you can play music with someone, like oftentimes like the eye contact and like there's that old phrase, the eyes are the windows to the soul. I think that sometimes eyes can be windows, but also they can be mirrors. I took that even a step further. And I said, okay, well, my own eyes. Mm -hmm. And so this piece is really about the unveiling of a mirror it refers to the moment that you remove that sheet of metal from behind the glass, have just a moment of true realization and true perspective uh, for who you are, for what you're looking at. There's a moment in the middle of the piece where there's a transition and you can really listen for it. The groove totally changes, but the motifs stay the same. Like the intervals, I'm keep the same, turn them upside down or like basically just like remove the, the metal entirely. So that's what this piece is about. Here comes the unveiling of a mirror from the new album by my guest, Stephen Feifke who is also on piano, who composed and arranged a piece, and it features Joe Perry, Benny Benek, and Sam Dillon. Sam Dillon. Enjoy.
unveiling of a mirror, a composition and arrangement by my guest today, Stephen Feifke, who is also on piano, and it features his big band from a brand new release, Kinetic. So we're going to spend the hour on all these tunes because they're all amazing <laughs> compositions. Yeah, lead into one that's actually quite sophisticated in terms of rhythm, harmonically and, and melodically. You, you called it the Sphinx, so it has a little exotic touch here, kind of hinting to Eastern harmony, Southern rhythm, mixing it all up in, in interesting meters. So you, you just gave me a little demo, explain a little bit your, your <laughs> process here and really enjoy what you're going to follow. Well, there are a lot of changing time signatures in this piece, but I try not to analyze the composition as I'm writing it. Like whatever's coming out is what's coming out, and I'll figure out what's actually happening later. This piece actually was the final piece I wrote as part of my master's degree at Manhattan School of Music. I was really lucky to study with Jim McNeely, one of my all-time favorite pianists and composers and someone who I'm really lucky to be able to call a mentor. The whole piece kind of like unfolds and it's very much stream of conscious. And Lucas Pino is the featured soloist here. He just does such a wonderful job traversing the harmony of traversing the changing time signatures. But really what this is meant to be is just a journey into the, the tonality and the possibility of the mode. And that's all I wanted to do. That's all I ever wanted to do. But in this piece in particular, this is all that I wanted to communicate. And once I was finished with it, I listened back to it several times and I said, wow, like this really is such a, mis it starts off so mysteriously and ends with such strong sense of finality and resoluteness. The Sphinx, especially after seeing it in person, it just seemed like melodically it's like Eastern and rhythmically it's Southern. It just seemed like such a blend of musical cultures and identities that the Sphinx, the title really seemed to fit. So I hope that you enjoy the mysterious nature of it. And again, actually, this is Jimmy McBride on this one on drums. Well, thank you for all the insights and, and the setup. <laughs> so here is the Sphinx featuring Lucas Pino, and this is from... My guest Stephen Feifke's new album Kinetic with his big band.
from the album Kinetic, a new release by Steven Feifke, also the composer, arranger, and leader of the big band. We just had a really deep conversation about all the musical ingredients that went into composing this. The next one we're going to go to, it's, it's actually what's called a standard, meaning it's a song that's been in a tradition. Another role that you have as a big band leader as a writer is to reimagine somebody else's music. In this case, you had to come up with a version that works and it features Veronica Swift, which I think is wonderful. You know, I actually know her from when she was like 15 in Virginia and she was there with her mom and they needed mm -hmm. somebody to play for her. Wonderful to see you all out there. I guess in the 80s, they would have called you all the young lions or whatever <laughs> else. I know, but the thing to consider is that you all take these old songs reimagining a i think it's fascinating that what draws that younger generation to the old songs or makes them stay and be how you approach that to do it and, and give it that fresh view it's a beautiful song all on its own i just stayed out of the song's way i wanted to give veronica a really lush bed of textures orchestrationally speaking to allow her to just be as free as possible you know there's two vocal numbers on on my record there's this one until the real thing comes along and then there's another one on the street where you live could not have approached these two songs any more differently when i arrange a vocal song like i want to do two things first of all i want to stay out of the singer's way i don't want to interrupt him or her with any random horn punches or with any like strange chord substitutions i set the song up in such a way that really it just lends itself to the character of whomever is singing it. And in this case, Veronica, just her tone is beautiful. It's warm. A vocalist of her caliber, there's nothing that I need to do. Let loose, let her loose. As opposed to on, this, on the street where you live, which actually I did significantly change from the original recording, which is meant to be like a medium swing, happy, I have often watched. I kind of turned that on its head and I turned it into 2021, 2020 version of, of the song which is to turn it into like a stalker version of it. And so to do that, like 
I changed a lot of the musical ingredients to make it seem darker, to make it seem less romantic, because that's what the lyrics say to me. I still stay out of the singer's way, and I still stay out of Veronica's way. And even though, like, there's not many ways to interpret the lyrics to On the Street Where You Live when the bass is going... <laughs> And the, and the trombones are going. There's not so many ways that she can interpret it. I really am staying out of the way and just saying like, you go for it, you got it. She just does an amazing job. And actually Andrew Gould is featured on the saxophone solo on this track. And he is one of the co-producers on the record. Learn to trust your band. And your lead alto saxophonist has the most information that you could possibly want, whether it's about personnel, whether it's about how the tuning is in the ensemble. If I'm rehearsing the band, I oftentimes just defer to Andrew and say like, hey, what did you think of this? Hey, do you think these backgrounds are too much? I'm not afraid to ask those questions. And Andrew <laughs> is not afraid to give me an honest answer, which is equally, if not more important. He plays beautifully on this track, compliments Veronica's really wonderful delivery of a beautiful set of lyrics. Calling her sultry, I think is the right thing. She's really making a mark as the next game changer in jazz. <laughs> So here is Until the Real Thing Comes Along. This is a semi-con song with other writers arranged by my guest today, Stephen Fife and featuring Veronica Swift on the vocals from the new album, Kinetic.
comes along until the real thing comes That was Until the Real Thing Comes Along, arranged by Stephen Feifke and featuring Veronica Swift on the vocals from the new album Kinetic with the Stephen Feifke Big Band. We're enjoying several selections and we went from various originals composed at different times to taking standards and arranging them. This one is a different kind of standard. This is more of these are the jazz compositions that we use. This is a Horace Silver composition Nika's Dream, one of the ones dedicated to patron of jazz at the time, the Baroness de Königwater, who helped so many of the jazz musicians. So there's so many tunes with Nika in it. This uh. one is really special, and it's actually not an easy tune to play. So most musicians, you know, it's later in their journey to learn this because it has this transitions of these minor major chords moving up and down. You took it on, you arranged it. It must be a Horace Silver admirer. What is it about Horace Silver? Horace Silver's approach to music, I find, is just very elegant. Never too much, always perfect amount of musical information, compositionally speaking and pianistically. He's very rhythmic, he's very motific, and he's very creative. What drew me to this song, actually, the melody. And when I started to arrange it, I was younger when I arranged this. I came to this song when I was about 19 years old, didn't know any better. And the reason I'm saying I didn't know any better is because at that time, like, to me, Nika's Dream was just a cool melody and, you know, the arrangement was what it was. But now that I'm older and wiser, I recognize recognize that Nika's Dream was like in the original recording, just a fully fleshed out arrangement. And it's not just, you know, in all of Horace Silver's songs, you know, they might be in the real book and they might be able to be presented in like a lead sheet fashion. They're all like very complex style mm -hmm. compositions that consist of introductions, that consist of melodies, that consist of interludes, that consist of backgrounds, codas. And the fact that you can fit that all on one page is actually even more remarkable. One of my students actually said this to me last week and it's really stuck with me. The great music is sometimes extremely complicated, but the beautiful music is oftentimes very simple. That really speaks to me. I don't think that simple sometimes in today's day and age, in reference to music anyway, seems to be not an insult, but like, oh, it doesn't change time signatures a million times. Oh, it doesn't use this atonal set of harmony. Like, and that's not my vibe. I just think music is music. Good music is good music. The reason that I started off by saying at 19 years old, if I had approached this arrangement by saying, what can I do differently to Horace Silver? I think I would have ruined it. But because I just approached it from this place of innocence and just like loving the melody, just like having fun playing around with Horace Silver's beautiful motifs and then flip it over. The bridge especially, like I, I opened it up so the harmonic rhythm is actually double of mm. what, or half, depending on how you want to think about it, of uh, what Horace Silver did in the original recording. Like that's not stuff that I did intentionally to say, check it out, Mr. Silver, I'm messing with your composition. You know, I was just like going with the flow and seeing where things go musically. And that's how I approach all of my music, whether I'm soloing, whether I'm composing, whether I'm arranging for myself or somebody else. I set this this arrangement almost like an 80s disco slash go-go beat. And then the bass line, you know, it's unison, piano and bass, left hand. And then there's some chord substitutions as well. And then eventually we do get into the swing feel. And I, being that he is one of my biggest compositional influences, like I threw a a pretty serious nod to um, the original and the original shout course is in there with a few things of my own that if you're listening closely and you know the original recording that you'll recognize that I did that reference previous parts of my arrangement. That seems to be a good introduction. I also want to say Benny Benack is, is also featured here on trumpet. Jimmy McBride is featured on the drums. He takes a solo on this one. And then I am also featured on the piano. One other thing is that this is featured on my septet album, Peace and Time 
which I released in 2015. Even though Kinetic is like my formal record, it's my second album as a leader. Benny and Jimmy both play on that record and they're both featured on that recording. So let's consider this a bit of an Easter egg for someone who's who's been following along. This is a arrangement well done and, and you're right, Horace Silver had everything worked out in a way that was meant that way and mm -hmm. we should start messing and turning it around but honoring. Here's Nika's Dream arranged by Stephen Feifke on for his recorded for his new album Kinetic features him also on very fine piano solos. We <laughs> Thank you, Monica. Piano playing. Fine from you, I, that means a lot. Thank you. you. And Benny Bennick the third on the trumpet. So <laughs> here it is. Enjoy. <laughs>
Nika's Dream, an arrangement by Stephen Feifke from his new album, Kinetic. We were talking about several selections now from this album, from originals and arrangements. So this last one, it is an original. It has a fusion touch that's way before your time. If you're 29, I can do that because <laughs> I grew up in that. And the really cool thing, it features kind of your second half, Alexa Tarantino. I want to talk for a second also how it is in balancing a household when you're two musicians with two careers because you know I do that all the time too my husband is a guitarist and we had bands together we played in each other's band but you always have to figure out you know whose band and how do you balance how do you guys do it I think we both have pretty strong musical identities paths that we want to follow artistically you know the fact that our paths cross you know in our own bands I think that adds a certain dynamic and creates some nice fun Alexa is featured here on this song you know what I was thinking about when I wrote this what if Neil Hefty wrote a funk chart for the Basie band. So it uses a lot of orchestrational techniques that you could hear on like a Count Basie recording, you know, where it has the trombones playing like a rhythmic figure, like maybe they'd be playing like a Charleston or something in the Basie band or a variation thereof. And this they're playing like a two, three style clave and like right. The backbeat is provided by Brian Carter. Brian Carter's on drums on this one. And he just really has such an immense knowledge of the history of the drums and of music in general that he sounds equally at home playing like driving swing on Wollongong as he does like playing on this track where he's just like, it's a history lesson in the drums. This kind of is a fun track that would use this to close out the first set at the Django and say like, come on, everybody, stick around got more coming for you next set. So on this album, it's the ninth track. It serves as like second to last one. And like, hopefully if this were a live gig, you would say like one more. So that's kind of the vibe of this one is like just fun, lighthearted. And the, rate, the, the way that I got the name Midnight Beat is actually my dad is a drummer, not professionally. My family is from South Africa. Him and my mom are high school sweethearts, moved to the States and both my parents are musical. And that's how I started getting involved in music. But my dad, when he was a kid, like when he was 14 to 16 or whatever, him and his friends had a wedding band that they used to call Midnight Beat. I just could not think of a name for this piece. And like the name is so fitting because we used to play this at midnight. It has a backbeat. And I basically like my, we were going through old family photos like of my parents as kids in South Africa. And I just saw my dad playing this like humongous drum set. And he was like 14 year old. This like big text on the bass drum. It's like midnight beat. And I was like, dad, what's midnight beat? He's like, oh, that's the name of our wedding band. And just like everything clicked. And I was like, okay, that's the name of the song. So it's like a, a nod to my parents. Oh, and it also featured Dan Shmolinsky on the bass. That's right. You got to have a bass solo in there somewhere. In the <laughs> it didn't used to have a, a bass solo. It was a decision that we made like in the studio. This is the last song that we recorded on the first day of the session. And we were playing and we were playing. I was like, this is missing something. It's missing a bass solo. He's such an amazing bass player. He holds it down the whole time. And then just like when it's his chance to solo, he just plays like the grooviest solo. So thank you so much for taking the time and sharing about your music. It was just super informative. I really enjoyed the insight. Thank you, Monica. Yeah, thank you for having Making me. Making off and the composition. Thank you and make sure to find Kinetic by yes. Steve Feifke. It's on Outside in Music. And you can get it directly from my website, which is music. Feifke being F-E-I-F-K-E. -E. Thank you for being here. So one more. This is Midnight Beat featuring Alexa Tarantino on the alto sax and Dan Shimelinski on the bass. All right, here it is.
Thank you for listening to Talking Jazz. My guest today was composer, arranger, pianist, educator, Stephen Feifke. Tune in for Talking Jazz every Thursday at 11 a.m. and every Monday at 7 p.m. right here on WETF 105.7 FM in South Bend, Indiana, or online at wetfthejazzstation.org. Also find videos of previous shows on YouTube on the Monica Hersick channel. That's M-O-N-I-K-A-H-E-R-Z-I-G. Subscribe to get the newest updates. Thank you for listening.